And I close my eyes And I'm floating along And I close my eyes And I'm drowning along Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu it gives me great pleasure to welcome you back to another episode of our fascinating series, Sirat Rasul, Lessons and Morals. I am your host, Yasir Qadi. In today's episode, we will discuss the early manhood, the adolescence of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and a number of important incidents that occurred in that time period. In our previous episode, we have already discussed the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had been orphaned a number of times First, his father passed away while his mother was still pregnant with him. And then his mother, Amina, passed away when he was only six years old. And then at the age of eight, his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, also died. Thus, he was raised in the household of his uncle, his father's full brother, Abu Talib. Now, as we said, Abu Talib was a very, very poor man. And the Prophet wasallam had to work at a very young age because of that. And of the things that he did, was that he used to work as a shepherd for the people of Mecca. Some books of Sirah also narrate a very interesting event that occurred in the early years of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, there's some dispute about the authenticity of this incident. However, I will narrate. The incident revolves around the journey of the Prophet ﷺ as a young boy with his uncle Abu Talib all the way to Syria. When they reached the borders of Syria, they passed by a monastery, a place of worship, belonging to a, in Arabic, a rahib, meaning a hermit. He has secluded himself in that place of worship, and he has dedicated his life to the worship of God, the worship of Allah. So they passed by this monk, and his name was Buhaira. Buhaira exited his house and rushed forward to greet this caravan of Abu Talib. And he invited all of them to his house, his monastery, and gave them a meal. And he asked, is the entire caravan present? They said, no, we have left one person, one child by the name of Muhammad wasallam. So he said, call him as well. When he saw the Prophet wasallam, he told Abu Talib that this is going to be the future Prophet. This is the Prophet that God has sent to mankind. Be careful that the Romans and the other people don't harm him because they will try to trap him, try to kill him. And he was asked, how do you know this? Buhaira responded, I saw the trees prostrating to him. I saw the cloud sheltering him. I saw certain signs that indicated to me that he was a prophet. So this is the story that is mentioned in some of the books of Sirah. However, many of the scholars, the more uh, verifying scholars of Islam, the scholars of Hadith, the scholars of Sirah, they say that this story is not absolutely authentic. Two major incidents occurred while the Prophet ﷺ was still a young man. And these incidents are the wars of Fijar. They're called the Fijar Wars and the Pact of Fudul. So there are two names here, Fijar and Fudul. The first of them is a series of wars. They're called the Wars of Fijar. What happened was that two of the tribes of the Arabs, one of them the Quraysh, and that is the tribe of the Prophet ﷺ, and another one, Hawazin, they began to fight an illegal war, a war that should not have been fought. And the Quraysh were in the right. So the Prophet ﷺ was still a young man. He was too young to physically fight. But he says, I remember my uncles fighting. And I remember that the Quraysh were fighting. And I would help them in this fight by picking up the arrows that the enemy had thrown and handing them to my uncles. Now you realize in those days, arrows can be used on both sides. If the arrow misses its mark, you can then use it back upon the enemy. So the Prophet ﷺ said, I remember, he's telling his memory to the Sahaba many, many years later, I remember as a boy, as a young man, which means he must have not even been 14 years old because he did not participate in this war. He only helped them by giving them arrows and by uh, helping in the back of the army. So he said that, I remember helping my uncles in this battle. And these are called the Fijar Wars. And this shows you the Prophet ﷺ played an active role in the society that he was living in. He did not stay away from the actions of society. When Mecca was under threat, when the Quraysh was attacked, he participated in the defense of Mecca. He participated with his uncles in fighting against the tribe that was attacking. That was the tribe of Hawazin. 
The second incident is more interesting. And this is called the Pact of Fudul. The Hilf al-Fudul, the Pact of Fudul. And this pact revolves around an incident that occurred in the early years of the Prophet's life when he was still a young man, where in the time of Hajj, a certain trader came to... Now this person of the Quraysh was a very noble, high statured person, a very rich person. And he told him that I will pay you your money later on. So give me the goods and I will pay you your money in a few days. So the man gave him the goods. When the time came to give the money, he came to the Qurayshi, the rich Quraysh person and said, give me the money. The Quraysh person said, later on, still there's time. So he came again and again and again and every time that person would refuse to give him the money and make an excuse. So this man went from house to house asking the people, who can help me get my money? But nobody helped him. Nobody helped him. At this, at the end of Hajj, he came in front of the Kaaba and he gave a very long line of poetry, a long poem. And that was the main of community, that was the media. In those days, writing a poem was writing a newspaper, you're spreading the news. And he announced his poetry. He shouted his poetry out loud in front of the Kaaba. It's a very beautiful uh, series of lines, we cannot say it in Arabic. But the main phrase in it is, O people of Quraysh, of what are you so proud of? that you claim to be inheritors of the Kaaba and protecting the Kaaba and, and living in the holy city when you are dishonest and you don't even help the weak and help the oppressed against the evil person. Here I have come from a faraway place in Hajj and I have sold my goods to so and so and he has refused to give me money and not a single person has helped amongst you. What is the point of all of this nobility? Of what good is your status? So he criticized them and he rebuked them. And the news spread amongst the tribes that this is what the Quraysh has done to this poor man. At this, the uncle of the Prophet wasallam, Zubair, the son of Abdul Muttalib, this would be one of the older uncles, he convened a gathering. He called a meeting of all of the noblemen of Quraysh, all of the leaders of Quraysh. And he said, this is not good. It is not something that we are proud of. How could this have occurred in Mecca in front of our eyes? We need to make sure that this incident is never repeated. Firstly, they made sure that this rich merchant paid the man, the rich person of Quraysh paid the man back, and then they said, we will now all sign a treaty, gather together and sign a treaty that we will uphold the rights of the oppressed and return the goods and the items that are owed to those to whom it is owed. In other words, this treaty was meant to uphold justice and to make sure that no person got away with injustice. No person was tyrannical in his interactions with other people. And of the people who was invited to witness this pact was our beloved Prophet wasallam. Only the elite were invited. In other words, the leaders. Every member of one of the tribes was invited in order to vouch for the rest of the tribe. And one of the person, in fact, one of the youngest people to attend was our beloved Prophet Muhammad wasallam. And they all testified in front of the Kaaba that they would always be just in their dealings, that they would always uphold honesty, that if anybody was owed any money, anybody was oppressed, then all of them would come together, regardless of what tribe did the oppressing. And they would demand from the oppressor that he gives back what is due to the weak and the oppressed. The Prophet ﷺ, many, many years later, he said, I witnessed the treaty of Fudul. I was there, I was present, and I am proud of it. I am happy of it. And if I were called to uphold this treaty, even now, in Islam, meaning now that he's a Muslim, many, many years have gone by, meaning that the religion of Islam has started, he's a prophet of Allah, he says, even now, in Islam, if I were called, I will uphold this treaty. So this shows us the Prophet ﷺ was proud of this treaty. And he said, I still uphold it. And it was a treaty that was meant to serve justice to all parties concerned. Just because you're rich, just because you're famous, just because you have power, you're not going to get away with injustice. That was what the purpose of the treaty is. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I was proud to have been present there. Now this treaty really and truly shows us a very, very interesting and important point. And that is that the Prophet ﷺ, despite his young age, he was invited to attend this treaty which means his status was quite significant. Hence, 
they had already appreciated and acknowledged the status of the Prophet ﷺ. Only the senior most people were invited. And yet the Prophet ﷺ, despite his young age, he is probably now still 18, 19 years old, 20 years old maximum. They have already invited him. And that shows that he had those qualities of leadership already at that age that the other people witnessed this quality within him. We'll take a short break now and we'll come back and continue talking about the implications of the Treaty of Fudul. Stay with us. Welcome back. We were discussing the implications of the Treaty of Fudul. The Treaty of Fudul, we said, was meant to uphold the justice of society. And the Prophet ﷺ participated in that treaty. Now, one of the most important lessons that we learned from the Treaty of Fudul is the fact that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, took an active role in participating in the social problems of Mecca. Now the problem of injustice, the problem of cheating, the problem of not giving the merchant his due, this is not necessarily a religious problem. It is a problem that is involved with the civic and the societal level. Yet the Prophet ﷺ took an active role and he was proud of it. And he said many many years later after he became a Prophet, he said, I was there and I was proud to have been there and if I am called to fulfill the treaty even now, I am prepared to do so. This shows us, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, that wherever we live in the world, wherever we live, doesn't matter if it's a Muslim country, non-Muslim country, doesn't matter if we're living amongst Christians, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, atheists, it doesn't matter. Where there are social problems affecting the entire community, then we should and we must get involved. Crime, rape, plunder, disease, thefts, AIDS, all of these things. The fight for finding a cure for cancer. These are general problems that humanity faces. Many Muslims think if this is not a religious issue, I will not get involved. This is a big mistake. Here the Prophet ﷺ is getting involved in a social issue. An issue of economic justice. And he is proud to have been involved. And he says, if I were to be called right now, I will be proud to fulfill that treaty. And this shows us that we as Muslims have to be active members of a healthy society. We should take an interest. What is happening around me? What are the problems of my society? Some of them are religious problems. We solve those. Some of them are problems that face all of our society, independent of religion. Crime and poverty doesn't care what gender and religion you are. It affects everybody. And so we as all human beings have to gather together to fight those problems. And of course, we as Muslims, we fight religious problems as long with the civic and the communal and the social problems. We do them hand in hand. The problem comes when some Muslims think, if this is not a religious issue, I don't care about it. But you see, as we said, crime and poverty are general humanitarian issues. And we have to all come together. And the Prophet ﷺ showed us this example. That this is something that is indeed a part of our religion. And when we do it with the right intentions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will indeed reward us. This leads us to the next major incident at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that was his marriage to Khadija. Khadija was the daughter of a famous person by the name of Khuwailid. Khadija, the daughter of Khuwailid. And her father had left her quite a large inheritance. And she had been married once and according to some books even twice, but her husbands had died and so she was now a very wealthy widow and merchant. And she would take this money that she had and hire out people to take caravans all the way to Syria. So she would use this money as a business investment, purchase the goods of Mecca, whether they're spices, whether they're leather, whether whatever the material that was available in Arabia, and then send it all the way to Syria. And she would hire somebody to go to Syria. In Syria, he would sell these goods to the people of Syria, and these are goods not available there. He would in turn purchase the items from Syria that were not available in Arabia, and bring them back, and she would then sell those. So it was a very, very profitable business. And in fact, as we said, this business was the common business of the merchants of Arabia. That is what they used to do. Buy and sell by traveling very, very far. In the summer they would go north, in the winter they would go south. Khadija was one of these merchants. And so it is mentioned that one occasion, the Prophet ﷺ was hired out by the sister of Khadija, the sister of Khadija, to be a shepherd. Remember we said he was a shepherd. So Khadija's sister owned a flock of sheep. So she hired out the Prophet ﷺ 
along with another person to take care of their sheep for a number of days and months. When that time came and finished, the person said to the Prophet ﷺ, let us go demand our wages from the woman, meaning the sister of Khadija. Let us go demand what, we, what is owed us. The Prophet ﷺ said, I am too shy, you go on my behalf. In other words, he didn't want to go and ask the money. Perhaps because it was a woman involved, perhaps because he didn't like the fact that he's asking for money, even though it is not that he's asking, this is his wages, this is his salary that is owed to him. But he said, I feel a bit shy, why don't you go? So this man went and Khadija was visiting her sister when the man came. And when the man came and said, can you give us our wages? Khadija's sister paid the money but said, where is your companion, Muhammad said, Where is the other man? I hired two of you. So the man said, he was too shy to come. So I came on his behalf. At this, the sister of Khadija began to praise the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, immensely because she had interacted with him a number of times in the course of this job. And she said, I have never seen a more handsome and a more honest and a more trustworthy and a more noble. And she kept on praising the Prophet ﷺ man than this man, Muhammad ﷺ. So Khadija felt something for him in that this was a description that she kept on praising, praising, praising the Prophet ﷺ. And it so happened that Khadija had to send a caravan to Syria. So she was wondering, who should I send? One of her servants said, why don't you send this man, Muhammad, who has been praised so much by your sister? So Khadija thought this was a good idea. So she sent this servant to the Prophet ﷺ and offered him the job of taking the caravan all the way to Syria, buying and trading and selling and then bringing it back to Mecca. And so the Prophet ﷺ asked his uncle Abu Talib what should be done. And this shows us the respect that the Prophet ﷺ gave to Abu Talib, the elders, respecting the elders as part of our religion. Any man would have jumped at the opportunity. This is the richest lady of Mecca offering the most lucrative job you will get a percentage of the profit. This is the most lucrative job. Every man would have jumped at the opportunity and gone and taken the job. But the Prophet ﷺ waited and he went and he asked his uncle, what do you think I should do? And look at the respect and the adab. Look at how much he respected the elders, that every decision he would take of this nature, he would ask the people who knew better. And Abu Talib said, how can you turn this down? She is a noble lady and this is a very good job. You should take it. So the Prophet ﷺ took this job and he went on this journey and because of his honesty and because of his dedication and because of his good manners, he brought back a much larger profit than any other person ever done for Khadija. And he brought back a little fortune with him. And no other person had ever done this. How did he do so? Because obviously the blessings of Allah upon him and also his honesty and his good nature and his, the fact he's not lying, he's not exaggerating. He was acting like a true Muslim businessman. And so he made a lot more money than all of the other people had ever done. And when Khadija saw this, she was even more impressed. And she gave him double the amount that was promised. She gave him even more that was promised because of the impression that the Prophet ﷺ had had upon her. And Khadija had also sent a servant along with him. The servant came back and began narrating lots of stories about his honesty and about how he treated the people. And he also gave some small miracles that wherever the Prophet ﷺ went, a cloud came above him. He was never in the sun. That it just so happened whenever they moved, there was a cloud above them. Whenever they stopped, the cloud stopped as well. And so the servant kept on narrating all these stories. And Khadija felt even more towards the Prophet Muhammad And the issue or the talk of marriage came up. Now, the books of Sirah have differed. Who was the first to initiate the proposal? It appears that the the servant of Khadija who was sent to the Prophet ﷺ, it was that servant's idea to explicitly mention it. And so that servant, her name was Nafisa, she asked Khadija, do you not think that this man would make a perfect husband for you? And Khadija became embarrassed and said, why would he ever marry me? He is such a noble person and so on and so forth. And I already divorced and why would he want to marry me? And so Nafisa went to the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ and asked, said the same thing. Do you not think that uh, Khadija would make such a noble wife for you. And he said, why would she want to marry me? I am just a person who she has hired. I'm her worker. I'm working for her, you know, to, in the caravan. Why would she want to marry somebody like me? And she is such a rich person and, and such a high status and whatnot. 
And so Nafisa realized that there is indeed a possibility. Both of them are blaming on the other. And so then eventually this marriage was arranged. The Prophet's uncle came to the family of Khadija and proposed for the hand of Khadija and they graciously accepted. And so the marriage was performed. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, at this stage was 25 years old. The Prophet married Khadija at the age of 25. Now here, Khadija, what was the age of Khadija? You see, as we said in a previous episode, there are many classical books of seerah. And most of the people only know of one or two books. But the reality is there are many books. If you look at all of these books, you find that a number of different ages are given. One book mentions she was 40 years old. And this is the commonly held opinion that many people know that she was 40 years old. However, other books mention that she was around 28 or 29 years old at the time of the marriage. And of the people who mentioned this is Ibn Ishaq himself, the most famous book of Sirah, Sirah Ibn Ishaq. It mentions that Khadija was around 28 or 29 years old at the time of marriage. And if you think about it, this actually makes more sense because Khadija had six or seven or maybe even eight children from the Prophet We'll come to the children of the Prophet in a future episode. But she had at least six children with the Prophet Whereas a woman of 28, 29, it is much more realistic that such a woman has six children. And Allah knows best, but it appears that the stronger opinion is that she was around 28, 29 years old and the Prophet Muhammad was 25. And this shows us the importance of modesty that indeed it was obvious that there was some attraction. And this is something that we have to say very, very bluntly, that feeling an attraction for the opposite gender, when you're about to get married, this is natural. But we have to keep that in check and make sure that everything is done in a halal and a permissible manner. And this is exactly what happened with the marriage of the Prophet ﷺ and Khadija, that indeed there was some type of mutual attraction. Khadija did indeed uh, feel that towards the Prophet ﷺ, but there was a done in a proper procedure the perfect and the pure methodology where no other sin, no sin at all was done. Rather, the parties that were involved were approached to the families and the families then agreed and the nikah took place. And this is a beautiful example for us that shows us one of the ways of getting married in Islam. Also, this shows us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the perfect person for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Indeed, Khadija was one of the most noble of his wives. And Khadija helped the Prophet Sallallahu like none other of his wives helped him. Khadija spent her own money and her own time. And Khadija comforted and supported the Prophet Sallallahu in times of his distress. So much so that even Aisha, many years later, when the Prophet married her, Aisha never met Khadija. Many years later, Aisha said, I was never jealous of any woman apart from Khadija, even though I never met her. Because of how the Prophet ﷺ mentioned her. He would always mention her with such love and care that Aisha felt jealous of Khadija even though the two had never met. And there are many, many more blessings of Khadija. Perhaps we will talk about those blessings in a future episode. But what is important to realize is that in this time of the Prophet ﷺ, he had already established his reputation amongst the Quraysh. The Quraysh already respected him and by a very a reasonable age, around 25, his marriage with Khadija was finalized and took place. And Khadija eventually became the mother of all of his children, except for one child by the name of Ibrahim. We will talk about that in a future episode. This brings us to the conclusion of today's episode. Insha'Allah ta'ala, I hope to see you next time. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.